Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Sechim Ling Center for Tibetan Buddhist Studies Virtual Gampa. Um, we're so glad you could all join us tonight for anger, social justice, and Buddhism <clears throat> in conversation with Sujatha Balaga and Aisha Shahida Simmons. Uh, I'll just go over a few housekeeping things to start us off. First, as you heard from Zoom, we are recording the session. So being here in our Zoom room means that your image, your voice, or your questions might be part of the recording, which we may post publicly. Um, I'm gonna turn closed captioning on for tonight. Um, if you see it and you'd like to turn it off, or conversely, if you don't see it, but you'd like to read the captioning as we go along, um, you can click live transcript at the bottom of your screen and click show or hide subtitles. And we should have time this evening for questions for our speakers. Um, we're gonna ask everyone to type your questions in using the chat feature and send them directly to Sujatha or Aisha. And then time permitting, they'll take questions towards the end of the session. Um, so it's been really wonderful to see the positive response that we've gotten for this program, uh, starting as soon as we posted the event. Um, it's really a testament to how important and relevant the topics are, uh, but just as much who our speakers are. Uh, Sujatha Balaga is a longtime student and supporter and speaker with Seichen Ling. Her work is characterized by an equal dedication to crime survivors and people who've caused harm. A former victim advocate and public defender, she speaks publicly and inside prisons about her own experiences as a survivor of child sexual abuse and her path to forgiveness. Her personal and research interests include the forgiveness of seemingly unforgivable acts, survivor-led movements, restorative justice's potential impact on racial disparities in our legal systems, and Buddhist approaches to conflict transformation. She's a member of the Giotto Foundation in Richmond, California, where she leads meditation on Monday nights, and she was named a 2019 MacArthur Fellow. And this is actually our first time welcoming Aisha Shahida Simmons to our center, and we're so happy that uh, we can share her voice with our community. Aisha's lived experiences as a survivor of childhood and adult sexual violence, a black feminist lesbian and a 19 year Buddhist student and practitioner inform the creation of her cultural work. She's the producer and director of the 2006 Ford Foundation funded film, No, the Rape Documentary and the editor of the 2020 Foundation funded film, excuse me, the 2020 Lambda Literary Award winning anthology, Love with Accountability. A 2020 Soros Justice Fellow, Aisha is completing her Black Feminist Trilogy of survivor-centered cultural works that utilize storytelling as a praxis for healing, accountability, and disrupting sexual violence without relying on the carceral state. So I thank you both for being here, and I'll turn things over to Sujatha to set our motivation for the evening. Thank you so much, Gina, and thank you everyone for coming tonight. Uh, we're just overjoyed uh, at the opportunity to share this time together um, as longtime sort of comrades in the work to end sexual violence without reliance on the carceral state and, um, and also just blessedly Dharma sisters along the way in this journey. So it's just, um, this is wonderful. I think it's the first time that we're doing this together uh, where there's this nexus of all the things we care so, oh, it makes me a little emotional, all the things that we care so deeply about. And it's wonderful. Uh, to be doing this uh, at the center where I first took refuge uh, with uh, Geshe Dakpa. So, um, so this is just a really, this is a blessing on so many levels to be able to do this tonight with all of you. Um, so um, I thought it would be good if we could start with a little bit of breath observation, just uh, two minutes maybe of breath observation to get started and to center ourselves. Um, and um, if you are, I know that there's a, a quite a mixed crowd here tonight uh, in terms of maybe interest in Buddhism, interest in the topic more generally. Uh, some may be practitioners, some may not. Some Buddhist practitioners actually don't really meditate so much um, and go about things in other ways. And so uh, if you are new to meditation, two to three minutes can feel like an eternity. Um, I promise that... Um, I did actually leave uh, the, the timer on, the meditation timer is going to ring, uh, even if it feels like it never will. And so let's uh, start by uh, adjusting ourselves, being comfortable in the place we're sitting. There are many points of posture that are ideal, but the primary one is to have your 
spine as straight as is comfortable as possible while still remaining uh, comfortable. And so in, in whatever posture feels good for you um, beyond that, just uh, take a moment to just notice your body and that you are, that you have a body and that you are in that body. Um, and now let's take a moment to identify the breath as it's coming and going, either at your belly or your nostrils. And try to just feel the physical sensation of the breath as it comes and goes. If you're having trouble locating the breath, sometimes taking a slightly stronger inhalation can help you just feel the sensation of the breath. Now try to give that feeling and that sensation of the breath the same kind of attention just for the next couple of minutes, the same kind of attention you would give to a dear friend who is sharing something important with you. Let's just notice our breath now for a few minutes together. Thank you, everyone. It's always helpful to me to start with a little bit of silence to center myself um, and to be in the present moment with all of you. Uh, let's also take a moment now to sort of set our motivation for our time together today. Um, and so for those who practice in this lineage or want to do that in their own way uh, that involves evoking what we call sort of a bodhicitta motivation or this um, aspiration or commitment to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings, if that is a part of your practice, uh, taking a moment now with our calmer minds to sort of settle our minds into that type of thinking, that aspiration or that commitment uh, for listening together. Um, and for everyone else, just uh, trying to adjust our motivation to uh, engage in this discussion about anger in a way that's not just a benefit to ourselves, uh, but to others, uh, to really uh, make a commitment to try to keep our hearts and our minds open and to be gentle with ourselves uh, as we consider these topics. 
Uh, and that uh, I'm thinking that may what I learned here tonight help nudge me towards freedom from of emotions and responses that no longer serve me or the good things that I do in the world. Uh, and so that might be a motivation that you would want to uh, develop, uh, engage in at the beginning of our time together tonight. So, um, and with that, um, I think we decided that I would go first. And we're each of us are going to talk for about 15 minutes, Aisha and I. Um, and then we're going to ask each other a few questions based on what we heard from each other and then open things up to questions from everyone. So, um, so in thinking about this topic, um, it is extremely close to my heart. Uh, my work for many years uh, to uh, end sexual violence um, and trafficking and intimate partner violence uh, all was very much fueled for the first several decades of my life uh, from a place of uh, anger and, and rage. And that rage was really debilitating for me personally. Um, and I often found that it disserved my, uh, my goals. It didn't actually get me where I wanted to be. And at the same time, I felt that there, was, uh, there were good things about my anger uh, at times as well. And so it sent me on a multi-decade journey to deeply understand to the best that I could, uh, what is anger? Uh, what is it from a Western uh, psychological perspective? What is it uh, in the social, what is its purpose and value in the social justice context, both in terms of our collective desire for liberation, as well as uh, for my own uh, self-esteem with regards to the things that have happened to me in my lifetime. And then um, uh, I also started thinking about it from a Buddhist perspective. And um, so I'll talk a little bit tonight about what I've learned, a little summary of those things uh, that I've been grappling with over the past many years. So from a Western uh, psychology perspective, um, I think it's important to remember that our emotions have a purpose. Um, and so one of my favorite things I've ever heard His Holiness the Dalai Lama say was during an interview uh, with Time Magazine where they like asked him 20 questions or something and rapid fire questions. Um, and one of the questions was, if he ever feels angry or even outraged and he started laughing and he said, Oh yes, of course, I'm a human being. Generally speaking, if a human being never shows anger, then I think something is wrong with his or her brain. That is what he said. <laughs> so that was incredibly validating to me. And I think um, it was validating to me at a time when I was spending time uh, with uh, certain people who practice many different spiritual traditions, who engaged with me in a way that made me feel as if my anger, particularly towards uh, things involving social justice, um, and especially when those things were related to harms that I myself had suffered in the past, um, that I wasn't very evolved in my own spiritual journey. And so then to hear His Holiness say this um, really piqued my interest, not as a way of letting myself off the hook for the inappropriate ways in which I've expressed my anger in the past, um, or the ways in which I was starting to see how there were aspects of my anger that were not beneficial to me, but, um, but rather just as a, it was just, it was very interesting to hear him say that. And, the, and the, the jovial way in which he said it and the natural way in which he said it um, was really wonderful for me. So, so in thinking about our emotions from a Western psychological purpose, right? We can see uh, that all these things that relate to our fight, flight, uh, you know, appease, dissociate, freeze, these kinds of limbic responses that we have, they all have a really beneficial purpose. Um, so when we feel fear, we know that danger abounds, right? And when we feel sadness, uh, there's a real need to attend to disappointment and loss that can get stuck in our bodies if we don't have a way to release our grief, right? And anger uh, tells us something very important. It tells us, it alerts us to the presence of an injustice. That is its psychological purpose. Uh, it also alerts us to a time in which our goals uh, are being thwarted. And so sometimes those things are entwined for those whose lives are dedicated uh, to upending oppression. Um, our goals are often, uh, you know, entwined with issues of justice, right? And so uh, there's 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 a sort of double fodder there for anger for some of us. Um, and so uh, I think it's important to really understand that 
um, you know, when our um, when we are having anger and it's uh, activating sort of our fight, often our fight limbic response, um, sometimes that can be really beneficial to us and others, and sometimes not. And uh, it's really hard to see in the moment. That is the trick of anger, right? And so uh, sometimes it's after the fact that I realize, oh, it was really good that I used strong words at that moment. Oh, it was really good that my anger launched me out of my seat at that community meeting and had my hand on the microphone uh, before I even really realized that I was planning to do that, right? Or because in the end, my words were measured and they were uh, strong and effective, but it was anger that got me up out of my seat, right? It's um, the fire of my rage helped illuminate how disrespectful an ex-boyfriend had been to me and how much I needed uh, to get out of that relationship, right? I um, There are countless times in my life when having experienced harm directly to my body or seeing harm being done uh, to my friends where this very visceral, that is not okay, caused me to act in ways that were protective towards myself and others. Um, it also fueled countless revisions of my law school applications, right? That is not okay. This is not okay. Uh, this is not the way the world should be. Uh, it, it, it really came from that place. Um, and today it's still often anger that initially motivates me to sign a petition or take to the streets after another African-American person has been killed by a police officer. These things are very much fueled by feelings of anger within me to this day. Um, anger also motivated my drive to heal from the harms that I had experienced. Uh, when I think about the harms that were done to me, um, there was almost a feeling of no one's going to steal my joy uh, that caused me to really engage in my own healing journey. Um, and there was some anger mixed in with that. Um, so anger also can be really beneficial uh, for me at times when it doesn't feel safe to feel other emotions. So for example, uh, under certain circumstances when sorrow or powerlessness are not things that I'm able, uh, given the power differential happening in say a particular meeting or when I am trying to uh, achieve some positive end for somebody, um, I, I can't really let on um, the sorrow or powerlessness that I'm feeling. And so anger is another um, emotion that I'm feeling there that I might tap into instead. Um, so, uh, so these are some of the upsides of anger, some of the positive aspects of anger. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and while I see all of these as very much true, I know that sustaining them or having them go too far or too long uh, often feels like a flame burning to its own destruction. And I think Western psychology and medicine has shown us a lot. And so, so much has been written about the negative health impacts of uh, anger on one's own body, mental health, relationships, uh, sometimes in a way that almost feels like an indictment of any of us who've ever had it, even a, a brief moment of anger or, um, or ever been angry, right? Um, so it's really important to not see, see that information and that kind of data, that kind of, um, those kinds of studies are, are simply information uh, that can be beneficial um, and it shouldn't be taken as a way of shaming anyone or blaming people uh, for the negative manifestations of uh, anger in my own uh, body um, and mind. Um, but there was a certain point early in my life, luckily, when I was 24 years old, um, I realized that my anger was really doing me some significant harm. And I felt almost in my body that I could feel that my um, pretty consistent migraines at least twice a week and my severe stomach problems were linked uh, to my rage. And so, um, and that was rage that I carried both towards my father for the sexual abuse I endured in my childhood and also uh, towards um, anyone who perpetrated any of these harms, right? And in my work, I worked in intimate partner violence, sexual violence. I was carrying anger towards the systems and systemic oppression and all of it. I was just basically living in a ball of rage all the time. And I felt that it was doing damage, not just to my body and to my relationships, but actually to my work, um, that I wasn't as effective as I might be if I learned how to have um, more control over this aspect of my mind. And so, 
Um, so in 1996, uh, when I was 24 years old, I was living in India, working in trafficking, um, and very ineffectively because of my migraines and my stomach problems and my um, other issues. Um, and I ended up going backpacking by myself. And some of you have heard me tell the story. I ended up in Dharamshala, um, and through a wonderful and strange course of events, ended up um, being encouraged to write a letter to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Um, and um, I wrote in this little note um, that I tore out of my journal and dropped off at his office. It said, anger is killing me, but it motivates my work. How do you work on behalf of abused and oppressed people without anger as the motivating force? And so Tenge Tenzin Gichi, his holiness's private secretary, saw this note, was moved by it, invited me to meet with him. And then a week later, I had an audience with his holiness, the Dalai Lama, who gave me perfect, as one might imagine, advice about how to uh, let go of my anger. Ultimately, he did not rush me in any way, uh, but uh, ultimately I pressed and pressed and pressed him for advice about how to forgive. And uh, he ultimately did give me uh, some, some advice about how to forgive. Um, and um, I think I'll just briefly say that um, what I noticed at that time after, it, what, the first piece of advice he gave me was to meditate, was to uh, become more acquainted with my own mind. And that this level of rage that I was experiencing was my mind sort of out of my own control. And so to my mind, um, you know, in deepening my own meditation practice, and for many years I sat um, in the same lineage that um, Aisha used to sit in as well, um, which is, uh, you know, uh, the Burmese style uh, Vipassana. Um, so I sat, I think, seven Vipassana courses over the course of uh, several years. And during that time, I became extremely well acquainted with the physiological manifestations of my rage as it arose. I could literally feel like the blood rushing to my biceps when I was really angry in a meeting. And I would say, oh, look, uh, this is my body getting ready to throw a punch. Now, luckily, I didn't throw a punch uh, particularly in meetings, um, but I have thrown punches in my life, and it, I never, I've never thrown a punch since being able to uh, notice in my body when my rage is arising. Right, um, but it's really interesting to note, you know, the mind-body connection is quite real. Uh, your heart picks up a beat when you're at the movies, right? Whether it's a romance or it's a horror movie, that heart starts beating faster. And so um, really becoming more acquainted uh, with these things in my body and noticing also the sustained damage that can happen when I am living with longer periods of rage, digestive issues, headaches, sleep disturbance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, um, you know, when, so it started to cause me to ask the question, when does holding on to my anger, even if it's legitimate, uh, do me more harm than good? Do the work that I'm trying to do more harm than good? Um, and so, um, so that's sort of been the journey that I have been on with my own anger. Um, I was extremely pleased a few years ago to see that His Holiness has written this little book, if people can see it, it's called Be Angry. <laughs> And I'm going to read a couple of quotes uh, from this book now, which really help me. As you can see, I've got quite a few little tabs on here because I this is a go-to for me. Um, and two of the things that he says in this book that are most beneficial to me are these. Um, anger, he says, anger towards social injustice will remain until the goal is achieved. It has to remain. In this case, one should truly continue to harbor a feeling of anger. That anger is directed towards the social justice itself, along with the struggle to correct it. So the anger should be maintained until the goal is achieved. It is necessary in order to stop social injustice and wrong destructive actions. So this is one thing His Holiness has said. Um, and, and then other thing um, that, um, it says in this book is, uh, to be angry on behalf of those who are treated unjustly means that we have compassionate anger. To be angry towards the person in power does not create change. It creates more anger, more resentment, and more fighting. And so you can see how this can, that 
you know, that His Holiness can say this. And for those of you who are um, familiar with uh, Shanti Deva's Bodhicharya Vatara, Chapter Six, it might feel like what His Holiness wrote this book <laughs> called "Be Angry." Uh, when we know that he's a huge fan of Chapter Six and he's written a lot about Chapter Six of the Bodhicharya Vatara, which characterizes. Um, you know, uh, anger as a poison and kind of the worst thing that a human being can um, experience and that, you know, one flash of anger can destroy eons of merits and all of these things are written in the Bodhicharya Vatara. Um, and I think that it's important um, to, to think about this word and what it means to have compassionate anger. Um, for me, I, I think that I, one of the things I rely on the most um, is um, really trying to understand when I am using a spiritual bypass for myself or more broadly. Um, I tend to rely on verses four, five, and six of the eight verses of thought transformation whenever I'm feeling rage arising in me. Um, and so I would check out that text, the eight verses of thought transformation in chapter um, and verses four, five, and six. And I would make sure that you listen to his holiness. There are many recordings of his holiness talking about this particular text. And he's very clear in how he talks about, um, about those, those three um, verses. And they're often, um, they're, they can be misunderstood as uh, inviting abuse and harm upon ourselves. Um, and that is not at all how His Holiness intends for us to understand these words. Um, and so I think that that's, that's another thing that I think is quite important. Um, so, so for me, uh, the anger is extremely detrimental when it, when it doesn't serve any positive purpose, right? When it's counterproductive. So I think of, for example, when I yelled at a sexist classmate who was making an argument that women lack uh, the, um, were too emotional to serve as a nation's premier, uh, I handed him his argument, right? <laughs> at that moment. And, um, you know, I could see from his smug smile that he'd really won that one. Um, it's a perfect example of when I'm thwarting my own interests and working at direct cost purposes of the thing I'm trying to, um, you know, that I'm trying to get through, get to. And it makes me think often of a story that His Holiness tells about his driver um, when he was in Tibet, or maybe it was right after he came to India. He, um, his driver was trying to fix something underneath the car. Um, and when he, he, he was, when he was trying to fix it, he like, smashed his, he actually bumped his head into the, into the undercarriage of the car. And when he did this, um, he got so angry that he continued to hit his head against the undercarriage of the car. And when I think about this, um, so sorry, my dog is being very noisy, my apologies. Um, when I think about this, I think, when am I being the Dalai Lama's driver? Um, there are many times in my life when I am actually um, hitting my head against uh, the bottom of the car. Um, another time that I think about anger being detrimental, like what is detrimental anger, is when um, it's got diminishing returns, right? So um, the most important thing that happened in my audience with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, other than simply being in his presence and having his infinite compassion, um, you know, when I was telling him about the worst things that I had been through, um, is that when I was pressing him for advice about how to forgive my father, he responded um, with other pieces of like his own journey and advice. And I had to keep pressing and pressing and pressing him. And uh, only after I started to get really frustrated, I was like, no, I need like the one, two, three, like, how do I forgive my father? Um, he paused and he sat back and he asked me, do you feel you've been angry long enough? And the way he said it, it was completely clear that there was no right or wrong answer to the question, that he would have accepted no. And the way he said it, it really showed that there was a level of like horror at the things that I had told him. Not hatred towards my father, but a fundamental dis complete um, non-acceptance of the harm that had happened to me. Like that is not okay. I felt it quite firmly from him. And that was very much tied to this, do you feel you've been angry long enough? And so um, in the end, that's really a personal journey. Um, I think that it's something that uh, people need to really go on that journey themselves. I think we have to be very careful to not rush ourselves to a false sense of forgiveness or to letting go, or I'm not an angry person. We have to be very careful to not let 
um, these wonderful religious texts that we read and that we have uh, make us feel bad about where we are in our own journey. It's very important. Um, but I think we will know when we've been angry long enough, when we keep asking ourselves the question with loving kindness, with tenderness, uh, with self-compassion and understanding. Um, and just briefly, I would say, um, is antidotes to anger something that I work with is uh, patience. You know, again, chapter uh, six of uh, the Bodhicharya Vatara uh, is about patience. Um, and I think that's a really beneficial thing to try to develop. Also compassion, you know, there are causes and conditions, both our own anger, as well as the other person's behavior without excusing their behavior. I think it's important to understand what are the causes and conditions that are giving rise to the situation. And then um, to understand that sometimes that kind of compassion can look wrathful and that we can see this in many of our Buddhist deities, um, that there's a very, um, there are wrathful deities that are made of nothing but compassion. Uh, and sometimes we have to take very strong stands against things that must never happen again. Um, and so, um, so with that, I would say, um, I think that's it for me for now. And I'm gonna pass it on to Aisha. These are some of my initial thoughts and I hope um, they've been beneficial to folks. And I know you will benefit from the things that Aisha is uh, working on with these issues as well. Uh, I feel like even though we are on opposite sides of the country, <laughs> I was like, did we write some of these things together? <laughs> um, so first, I just want to thank you, um, Sujata, um, for the invitation to be in conversation with you. We've known each other for almost a decade. I can't believe it's almost a decade. It'll be a decade next year. And I remember and will always hold deep gratitude um, for you being the first person who held me and offered Tibetan prayers when I received word about um, the sudden death of my dear friend, Aaronette White, um, who died from an aneurysm. And so ever since that time, I feel like we've, we've been journeying together at times from a great distance and recently up close and personal and however the future, whatever the future has in store for us may, may that bond be unbroken. And I, I just wanna thank Gina um, for um, all of your behind the scenes work to make this event reality. It's so important that we remember these events don't happen in, you know, just out of thin air. Um, they, they happen, there's, there's usually a team and I don't know the whole team. I did meet Cindy, but folks behind the scenes who are making this happen. So um, I wrote notes um, because I needed to, so I could stay focused. And I, I wanna just share that. And um, before I begin, um, I'm very aware that Buddhism is not solely about meditation. And while meditation is an, it can be an integral part of Buddhist practice, it's not the only way that one identifies and moves in the world as Buddhists. There are countless Buddhists who don't meditate. And with that shared, my point of entry to Buddhism was through meditation. I was focused on meditative practice for a very long time before I even engaged in any form of theoretical study. And I was taught that practice surpasses everything. And so I, while I believe practice is everything, not necessarily surpasses everything, I believe that it's everything. I also believe in theoretical study um, because it's important um, so that we're not relying on one person's teacher's um, interpretation. However, with all that shared, I, I, I definitely offer my, my thoughts this evening on the power of um, meditation practice um, with rage. So I've been thinking about rage and anger for almost 30 years. Uh, initially, my rage focus was external, so I thought, because it was in response to the scourge of sexual violence. And even though I'm a survivor of childhood and adult sexual violence, I didn't think my rage had anything to do with my reality. So talk about just complete you know, disassociation in some ways. I start here because I believe many of us are not in touch with our rage as it relates to our own lives. Often, and especially in the context of social justice, many are righteously rageful on behalf of grave injustices happening in our community, society, and world. In 1994, um, my teacher, the late Tony K. Bambara, um, who's not a Buddhist, she was just my teacher outside of Buddhism. In one of her, her script writing workshops, I wrote a choreo poem titled A State of Rage. 
And the closing refrain of the poem is rage, meditation, action, healing. And it served as the compass for my film, Know the Rape Documentary. At the time, I didn't meditate, nor was I drawn to Buddhism or the teachings of the Buddha or Dharma or any of that. However, there was something within that made an intellectual connection between rage, meditation, action, and healing. I say intellectual because it was an embodied understanding. And even when I began my Buddhist journey in 2002, I still hadn't made the connection that rage can be an integral part of the healing journey. In fact, I would offer that it's only been within the past six years when I came face to face with <clears throat> my, my parents, my divorced parents by standing role to my childhood sexual abuse that I developed an experiential awareness about rage on the journey of healing. So for, ye for years, and especially in the tradition where I was a committed practitioner for 17 years before leaving in 2019, I grappled with having rage and yet being taught that it was a bad emotion. All of this in my mind's eye was fertile ground for spiritual bypass, especially in a society where the angry black woman is a trope. So how do I become a good Buddhist when I have so much rage? What exactly is a good Buddhist? How does one respond to injustices in one's family, community, and society? One of my Dharma sister and friends, um, Rima Vesley Flad, talks about giving anger oxygen. That is to say, not denying or suppressing the rage because it will implode. And whenever possible, not unleashing it onto others either. Um, the Zen Buddhist teacher, uh, Zenju Earthland Manual, recently shared how important it is to be in the mud of emotions, rage, sadness, despair, all of those difficult emotions. It's in the mud where there are so many nutrients. It's in the mud that we can grow like the lotus flower while always being aware that the goal is not the flower. The flower is the byproduct of being in the mud. The goal is soaking up the nutrients from the mud, not bypassing the mud. So over the years, I found solace and rigor through Vipassana meditation um, taught in the Burmese uh, tradition that Sujatha referenced earlier. It was an anchor in the storms and it still is an anchor. Um, meditation can be a compass for so much and for me, especially around rage. I'm the first to share that there are times when rage can be so overpowering that the absolute last thing anyone, especially me, wants to do is sitting or walking meditation. The urge is to react, which is very different from acting. And I speak from painful, continuous experience of reacting. Even when, from my vantage point, rage is justifiable, if I react as opposed to acting, I can and often cause harm to myself and also to others. Now, I believe that meditation is a radical call to action, hence the refrain, rage, meditation, healing, action. So it's a radical call to action, but right action. And that action begins with each one of us because at the absolute end of the day, the only people, the only people we are guaranteed with changing is ourselves. This in my mind's eye doesn't mean passivity in response to injustice. It means creating space to develop razor sharp clarity about how to act humanely and compassionately first with ourselves and by extension others. It means in each moment to moment to moment to moment, I have an opportunity. We all have an opportunity to not give innate power away as a result of egregious forms of familial trauma or other vicious and atrocious forms of oppression, including but not limited to white supremacy, patriarchy, heterosexism, socioeconomic challenges, ableism, and more. So example, I embody multiple identities, including but not limited to black woman, lesbian, who is a survivor of childhood and adult sexual violence. And all of these identities are marginalized and oppressed in the US and also globally. I can be empowered knowing that I have an opportunity to refrain from giving my power away in response to these vicious and atrocious forms of oppression and violence. In this moment to moment, 
each one of us can experience true liberation from within, regardless of what's happening externally. But this experiential understanding shouldn't ever be misunderstood or misconstrued as excusing or condoning internal personal societal violence or other forms of harm. I'm not suggesting that we just breathe, observe, calm our mind, focus on anicca or impermanence and not allow these external forces to impact us because they do. There is the ultimate reality of oneness. And then there's the apparent reality of differences. Two things are happening simultaneously all of the time. And we are impacted by so many things at the apparent level. And to only focus or encourage others to focus on the ultimate level is a slippery slope that can lead to spiritual bypass and even condoning of harm. So I do believe that meditation can create an opportunity for us to explore and be with the duality of the apparent and the ultimate without ignoring or worse, bypassing the apparent reality. The stillness on the cushion or the stillness and movement through walking meditation without getting lost in the story can give us an opportunity to develop clarity about what's really going on, to discern how to act, without causing further harm. This is rigorous work and it's not easy at all. And for me, it is trial and error with very tiny, at times it feels like microscopic glimpses of incremental progress along the way. It doesn't mean pretending I'm not angry. I wanna be clear, I still get overcome with rage and despair right now. Earlier today, as my partner, Sheila, and one of my Dharma teachers, Tereri, and my dear friends, Rima, Salai, Evelyn, Glinda, Krista, and Karen Nicole, held compassionate containers while I articulated my wage. And I can explain and even justify the rage. Even with that justification, I'm aware that the justification doesn't make me feel better, nor does it address the issue at hand. Tereri provided guidance today around the rage and encouraged me to turn inward so I could figure out how to move outward, action and not reaction. What this practice for me and the Sangha of teachers, and Sangha means community of teachers and friends, continuously teaches me is how to work with the rage, how to act and not react. Again, I wanna underscore that it's not about bypassing, but it is about working hard to not allow the anger and rage control our lives. And this is the tedious work for all of us, especially those who've been or are being betrayed and violated in a myriad of ways by family, friends, institutions, and society. There's a disconcerting myth that if you just meditated, you'll feel better, less rageful. And if you don't feel better, you're not meditating properly. I also often have heard um, that rage and meditation don't go hand in hand, or meditation is about just squashing the rage, as in, don't be angry, just be peaceful. And too often, survivors of all forms of violence, not just sexual, but racialized, economic, global, environmental, and marginalized folks are just told this by people who are directly or indirectly involved with inflicting harm at the apparent level. It's used as a shield to not be accountable. So what do we do with the rage? How can we channel it so that it doesn't destroy us in the process? The goal, the ultimate goal for me is true inner peace. And then I wanna believe that external peace can come if we can all be committed to it. Now, of course that sounds very utopic. And what is cr critical is that we're not dishonest with ourselves and each other, pretending not to be rageful when we are. Just why I really appreciate it, Sujata, when you shared how the Dalai Lama had asked you, do you feel like you've been angry long enough? Because there are many reasons to be angry and simultaneously, it's also important that we are radical within our interrogation of ourselves and examine the places where we've caused harm. Yes, even those who have been severely harmed can also and do often cause harm. Anger and rage are often in response to harm. And harm is on a spectrum from the most egregious to what some may view the most benign. 
We, regardless of our race, ethnicity, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, socioeconomics, physical ability, and national origin, again, at the apparent level, are all capable of causing harm. Most of us will cause some form of harm multiple times in this lifetime, and most of us will experience some form of harm, some form of harm multiple times in this lifetime. I see this a lot in our movements for radical social change. I've seen it in my family of origin. I've been harmed as a child, as an adolescent, young adult, and I've also caused harm. Is each one of us willing and able to hold both being harmed and causing harm? Are we willing to do the work to no longer cause harm? Can we hold compassion for those who caused harm? And I wanna be clear that in terms of holding compassion, I don't mean that in the absence of accountability, but I often think about in, 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 in the Brahma Viharas, the, the, you know, just the, the humble, the bold, the heart um, practices around loving kindness, around compassion, sympathetic joy and equanimity, that how we can use these practices in response to the harm that we experience in response to the harm that we cause with the hope that if all of us, and it doesn't, I mean, we're talking from a Buddhist perspective, but I, you know, if all of us could be, do that work internal and external that I wanna envision, I wanna hold on to hope and to a belief and not, it doesn't even have to be in this life, my lifetime, that we can move to creating that society, that beloved community that Dr. King talks about, that without violence, with love, with accountability. And so I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Aisha. It's always such a blessing to get to hear your brilliance and your, um, your just your incredible thoughtfulness um, and just um, grows my heart um, and pushes me to think in, in new ways uh, every time every time we get to be together. Um, I wanted to, um, we did get a request uh, in the chat. If I could ask you, I wanna ask you a couple of questions, but I think that everyone here might not know this term that we're both using, uh, which is spiritual bypassing. Oh, yeah. um, do you wanna, do you wanna answer it? Do you wanna define it? Or do you want me to, you go ahead. You go ahead, you start. I, can, I felt, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Well, I think there are lots of different ways in which people talk right. about spiritual bypassing, but, you know, from, um, so the, the general sense is at a very simple level, it's the idea of like, well, at the ultimate level, we are all one. And so if we are all one, um, I don't see race. Uh, I don't see your race. And so I can't be racist, you know, is, a, is an example, right? I'm trying, giving a concrete example. Um, but there are ways in which going to these ultimate realities causes us to sidestep the very real suffering that is actually occurring in our day-to-day -day lives. And it's actually used as a method. Um, it's almost like a gaslighting yeah, that's with, gaslight. held within it, right? Like it's this, well, if you were more enlightened, you would <laughs> be angry <laughs> about uh, these things. You would have moved past that, right? And I think when we think about spiritual bypassing, we have to remember the Buddha never did this. The Buddha was actually very, very thoughtful about who he was ordaining early on, like Dalit people, right? People who are outside the caste system, Like right? He was, there were so many things that I'm very, I want to be very careful about how I use the word political, um, because I don't mean it in the way we talk about politics in the United States, but that they were political acts, some of the things that the Buddha did, um, and that the very nature of a non-dualistic view was an incredibly radical thing that was attending to structural oppression in India at the time of his teaching, right? And so the Buddha was not doing a spiritual bypass. The Buddha was not saying everything is empty, and you know, and and so you know your suffering is empty, uh, you know, in this way that was dismissive in any way of that first noble truth, right? Like it, it, it he spent time deeply, deeply concerned with the well-being. Um, of people in their current temporal lives and a fundamental understanding he taught in different ways to different people because right. people were in different places in their own capacity to even think about some of the more elevated aspects of the Buddha Dharma that those of us who live incredible lives of privilege get to sit around and think about, right? right. And so I think that's, 
I don't know if that was too lengthy of an answer, but the, but the basic is, Aisha, if you would want to. No, I agree. I mean, I think that that it, that, that I've had that happen. You know, we've talked about this Jatha, around how, you know, when in, in maybe in, in certain spaces in, uh, at least in the, my former tradition and also in, in new traditions that I'm exploring or whatever, where, you know, um, it, about who's, who's speaking, who has access to speaking in terms of racial, racialized spaces. And I think it's, um, and then if you bring it up or talk about it, then what gets kind of say, oh, we're all one, or, you know, that this is divisive, or this isn't the Dharma, or, you know, that exactly, or just breathe and observe, or, yeah, that it's all, you know, it's, it's very, um, it can be weaponized it can be weaponized um in in our institutions and also can spirit you know spiritual bypassing or kind of can, can also be you know weaponized in partnerships if you're you know practicing in the same tradition or in family relationships kind of like oh well what does the buddha say about anger or why are you so angry rather than kind of like let's let's look at the anger right i've definitely had people say oh i thought you were i thought you were buddhist right right <laughs> you know? like Yes, I and that I am I am on a path and um, exactly <laughs> and 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 right now, ouch. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and I think right. that you know having authentic relationships with folks involves saying more of those things. And so this segues nicely into the question I was gonna ask you, and I don't know that there are easy answers to it, but in those settings, when when we are when we are aspiring to, you know. Um, operating in the ways in which you were talking about so beautifully, right? Um, and, and really uh, embodying um, that, uh, acting, not reacting, et cetera. On the way, we're going to react. On the way, you know, we're going to... And then, um, and even when we're not reacting, sometimes when we're acting and we're speaking from a place of action and saying, hey, here's this structural problem in this center, or here's this problem uh, in the world that I see. And people respond with, if you were further along the path, Aisha, um, you wouldn't be angry about any of that stuff. Uh, <laughs> how, do you, how do you take care of yourself? How do you protect yourself um, from, that, from that experience? Or how do you center yourself again uh, in the moment? Or what do you do in the moment? Maybe you don't do any of those things. I just yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I think I kept trying. I know in terms of thinking about a, a spirit, my a spiritual practice, I kept trying to put myself in a box. And so then I was kind of compartmentalizing, you know, myself and I was putting myself in a box. And after 17 years, I realized I can't fit in this box anymore. And I had to kind of go out and have a more expansive understanding and experience with the with the dharma and um so that was that's really um important and i think i think and so kind of in learning yes you know we know or i i know the harms of anger and i and i think for me what's been or or calling out like it's all it's always about kind of like that intention like how how i'm moving and let me, I, that's why I started, I want to be clear, like, I'm like, I had a rage fest today, like, I'm not, you know, I, I have, there's a lot of stuff that really keeps come, that's coming up. It's, it's like, um, it's like an onion. I was thinking about that. Like, it's just, you know, and each layer is more intense. And so, um, and I feel like the practice create is giving this opportunity to just keep going deeper. So I, I feel like the practice is kind of almost it goes against what we're taught in Western society. Like the more you do it, the easier it gets. Like the, if you keep working out, if you keep lifting weights, it's easier. And I feel like the more, the deeper you go with the practice, the harder it becomes because you're getting into the mud, you're getting into the sledge, you're like getting there. And so when, when that happens, I think I've turned to the cushion and I've also turned to community to process. Like, so it's been an internal, but also external. Um, I think specifically as a survivor um, who wasn't believed as a child, like, I think that there's kind of a like, is wait, is this right? I'm always questioning, always questioning. Um, and that's why I think it, and so it's like, yeah, there is the ultimate reality. And then we're living at the apparent level. And that's, I'm grateful for, you know, um, community um to to really be able to explore that and it not be viewed as on you know antithetical to dharma practice 
Thank you so much. Um, one of my favorite things I've ever heard Pema Chodron talk about is that when um, when you start meditating and you and you get to the certain point in your meditation practice and the waters are calm, you can look down into the water and you can see the dead bodies and the rusting cans and the garbage at the bottom of the river. Right. Like, that is so perfect. <laughs> it is a perfect, that's beautiful. It's right. so, that's it. Yeah. And the way it's she perfect. delivers it, there's, it's so much, it's so funny. It's like, and the water gets calm and it's so peaceful. And you look down in there and you're like, oh no, what is in there? How many more lifetimes of practice are going to be recorded? Right. <laughs> right. So, right. Um, yeah, I just, yeah. I appreciate that. Um, no, thank you for that. Yeah. So, I, yeah, please. I wanted to ask you um, uh, a question since we're, you know, talking about responding to injustice and from a Dharmic, uh, you know, perspective, you know, what does it look like for you to approach ending injustice without anger as the primary driver? Like, how do you envision or how are you doing that? Yeah. So it's a, I know it's a story I've told you about before, Aisha, but it's uh, one of my favorite experiences. I was in India and I was uh, meeting with a group of organizations that are working to end child sexual abuse in India. Um, and it was, oh, it's just an incredible journey. And I do a lot of work around trying to end um, I do these two bodies of work that actually overlap, which might be hard to get your brain around, but in the field of restorative justice, it makes sense. One is I'm trying to work to end child sexual abuse and forms of intimate partner and sexual violence. And the other is uh, ending mass criminalization, racialized mass criminalization in the United States. Um, and, um, and these two things intersect beautifully at the nexus of restorative justice. So, um, so when I was in India and I was meeting with these incredible organizations, um, one of which is in Bangalore, which is where my cousin who I'm, he's like a brother to me who I get to visit every few years uh, lives and he is an engineer. And I had just spent the day in these like deep and intense painful conversations about what's happening in the court system and what's happening with children who are both causing and experiencing sexual harm and what's happening in the juvenile detention facilities in India. And everything just felt like a hammer, like the system just uses a hammer about everything and it just smashes everything. And then our reform efforts also feel like we need to smash the system and it's just smashing, like we're smashing the people in the system and then we're trying to smash the system and everything's getting smashed. And I came home and my cousin and his friends were building a computer, a demo something for a conference that they were about to go to. And uh, if the thing was working properly, this little light was supposed to go off, okay? And um, every time they would tweak a little something and then they'd run their little test and the light did not go off. And they would get really excited every time the life light didn't go off. So I was really confused. I was like, wait, is the light going on a good thing or a bad thing? I thought it was supposed to happen. And, and he was like, yes, when it's working properly, the light will illuminate every time. And every time the light didn't go off, they got excited. And they were like, could it be this? Could it be that? Could it be? And they had so much space and creativity um, and joy at the puzzle of it. And I went to bed that night they, when, they, when they finally figured it out and the light went off, like what happened every single time, it was almost like anticlimactic. Like they were bummed that the party was over and they all went home, you know? And um, I wanna be really careful about using this analogy because I understand that it is utterly unrelated in terms of subject matter to what I work with every day. But I did have this question about like, well, nobody there picked up a hammer and smashed the computer they were trying to fix, right? Um, and every day in my work, it just feels like we've got like, we, all of our hands are like 12 hammers and that's how we're trying to fix everything we do. Um, and a lot of it comes from anger and a lot of that anger is righteous and correct response to injustice, right? And so I started to grapple with the question of what would it look like to try in some way, in some small piece that I can manage to bite off that same spirit that my cousin and his friends had, his coworkers had, um, about that computer. When I'm trying to think about ending child sexual abuse, when I'm trying to think about, you know, what are some ways in which we can bring more open-hearted, open-minded curiosity? Um, and I'm really use this uh, trepidatiously. It was more like as a mm -hmm. as a way of uh, just starting to imagine. Um, yeah. 
and I really don't want to like make it sound like they're the same thing at all. Trying to get a little light to go off on some computer that's going to do something like in whatever industry he was working at that time is not the same. Um, but but there was something there that was like just this aspirational feeling. Like how can we uh, draw pictures about the world we want to create? How can we? What is the thing we're going for? How can we imagine into and you know Miriam Kaba's work really inspires me in this way. Like this aspiring to like hope is a, is a discipline and and it's not our responsibility to constantly think about how to you know shut all that stuff down. Like let's imagine the world uh, that we want to be in. Like how can we bring more of that thinking uh, into the work that we do? Uh, really helps me. Uh, not just trying to stop the bad practices, but actually um, trying to have some open-hearted and open-minded curiosity about the positive outcomes we could be moving towards. Yeah, yeah. And it can be, you know, as as for survivors, I mean, and, you know, there are various forms of survivors, so I don't want to act like just survivor only means sexual violence. I know that there is that kind of something I was thinking about, like that, just that, um, you know, wanting, wanting to right that wrong or, you know, wanting to be seen or heard or acknowledged. Um, yeah, it's, there's, but it's like, so how do you, you know, I don't know, pay it forward. Cause a lot of times we can't, well, we definitely can't undo what was done. And a lot of times we're not going to get the type of support, accountability, healing, et cetera, et cetera, that we want or need um, for our harm. And mm -hmm. so how do we move forward? And I, I and honestly look to my guru a lot for this too, right? When I think about His Holiness, the Dalai Lama's response to the fact that, you know, um, he lost his nation, a sixth, a sixth of his people were murdered. Uh, he, you know, his temples were raised, all, all these holy scriptures were burned, single copies of things, you know, um, so, so much desecration of um, both holy objects and, and of an entire people's nation, right? The environmental uh, destruction that is happening to Tibet all day, every day, you know, his, this is happening to his nation. Um, and he maintains um, simultaneously joy uh, and and playfulness and 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 you know I don't think we think enough about the fact that what like when I met His Holiness when I was 24 and my friend who was with me was 22 His Holiness was telling us about having been put uh, enthroned and having full responsibility for his nation spiritual spiritually and temporally at the age of 23 he was a year younger than me you know when I met him. And imagining that level of responsibility, right? Um, but he does, um, he does really, uh, you know, manifest this capacity to simultaneously never um, dismiss the, the suffering of the Tibetan people. There's a really interesting video that I saw of him. It's in Tibetan and it's not translated, um, but somebody told me what he was saying. Um, and it was, um, it was a few years ago during Losar when there were a lot of people lighting themselves on fire in Tibet. And um, His Holiness made a very, very powerful and strong statement where he was, you really saw him manifesting as a, as a, as a wrathful deity. And he was like his voice, his body language, the way he was slamming his hand down, it was super powerful. And I um, and I remember that um, that he is all of these things and that we um, can aspire to be all of these things at the same time. And that he has never abandoned the cause of his people or particularly the environmental destruction that is happening um, that is gonna impact the entire planet um, as it continues to happen in, in Tibet. And, um, and at the same time, you know, I cannot think of a more uh, playful, open, curious, um, problem-solving mind, you know, it's really spectacular and deeply moving. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Should we um, open yeah. Should we open to questions? I don't know if people have questions they want to type into the chat. Oh, here's... And you can send them to either of us if you have one specifically for Aisha or one for me. Um, or if you have one for both of us, you can send it to either of us and we'll say for both of you. And then I'll like one of us would read it out loud. I just received a 
question from Gina from someone that's um, says, as a Buddhist, I'm supposed to consider impermanence and also Buddha nature, but the public discourse in our country re social justice seems not just polarized by people's minds seem but people's minds, excuse me, seem concretized. Thoughts, advice on how to deal with what seems like other people's rage spirals in public discourse. Ooh. <laughs> you got the question, Aisha. So how about you? Ah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I okay. So I let me just say that I I. I I, I have been, I've really been grappling with this one a lot because I agree that um, um, around folks being, their minds being uh, concretized um, and that things are polarized in this country and definitely other countries, but we're here. Um, and um, it's, and it's, it's very much, you know, don't, uh, my mind's made up. Don't confuse me with the facts, or or and and I'm or don't confuse me with any new information. I don't want to say the facts because that just applies that one way, is the is is the way, and um, I think honestly I that's why like and it feels really hard I was sharing this with Sujata before we came online um, that I I more and more I really I mean I think we have to do work we have to do external work because the the planet is in peril i want to be really clear but i also think that there is this there's another so we talk about spiritual bypassing but there's other forms of bypassing right like where we're not even looking at our own behavior so that if you're so rooted and glued into your position that you can't even hear even if it's and i'm i don't want to bring up any examples because anything could be polarizing but i can think of some things where i'm really clear that this is the way and that other way is not the way like is there any space for me not necessarily to like change my position but just to at least hear where the other person is coming from to hear whatever their fear is their anxiety and it's hard if their fear is based in you know racialized tropes or sexist tropes i mean it's very hard i mean so i feel like this requires such a, a level of 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 um of discipline that i don't that i think that i know i i strive i strive to to get there and i and i think that and that's why I, I started by inquiring about like, how can we look at ourselves? Well, also it's not in, 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 instead of looking at others, but really looking at ourselves. I, you know, there with, I'll just use a very brief, it's very abbreviated example around my own abuse as a child and, and, and coming to awareness about my abuse as an adult that happened to me as a child. And really grappling with how at the time I couldn't make any headway with my parents about their roles. It just, it was just like, I felt like I was going up against a brick concrete wall. And I, and so, yeah, I was definitely angry and there, but then I was like, where in my life have I, in my familial life specifically, have I caused harm, not sexual harm or any harm, but I haven't caused any sexual harm. And, um, and it was my brother in, in the sense, in terms of the harm that I, who's nine years younger than me, that I caused him in terms of being mean to him, angry. He was, I, he was uh, one when I was being abused at the age of 10. So I wasn't being protected. No one was protecting, listening, caring for me in response to the abuse. And so here he was, but that legacy played out well into adulthood. And so in 2015, okay, I'm 52, he's 43. So whatever that was minus six, you know, I had to go, I made the decision to go to him to be accountable for the harm that I caused. That doesn't take away from at the time what my parents weren't doing, but it was just a, a powerful moment to be like, where am I not being accountable for harm? And so I don't want to romanticize this huge political situation and where I feel like it, it, if something doesn't happen, we could all implode in, you know, the next few years. But it is an invitation for us to all look at ourselves while we're also looking at others. That is so beautiful. That is so, so, so beautiful. Um, just briefly add to that, and then I'm going to answer a question that came into me. Um, 
when his when I when the, I told you this, that His Holiness gave me two pieces of advice. I think when I asked him about how to forgive my father, and the first was to meditate, and the second one was um, he said align yourself with with your enemies in your heart, without excusing their behavior. Consider their position and their needs. Open yourself up to the possibility of their humanity. And so sometimes that is entirely for our own safety. That has to be an emotional practice. Like, I see you as a human being. Maybe that's all the further you can go, right? Or oh, I see an underlying need there that you are trying to get met. You may be meeting it in some really unhealthy and damaging way to yourself and others, but there's a way to open your heart in some tiny way to somebody's humanity. That doesn't mean you become their best friend. It doesn't mean you hang out with them, especially when their issue is related directly to your own identity and your own safety, right? Um, so that is something that I try to work with uh, when I am up against something that feels really challenging for me. Um, and the question that came in from Renu for me was, um, as a public defender, did you initially struggle when faced with defending men accused of sexual and domestic violence charges? Good, great mm. question. Yeah. So of course, I was a, I was a law clerk um, and then I was a public defender. And one of the biggest cases I had to work on as a law clerk was a massive child pornography case where there were 500 pictures um, that I had to sort through. And um, um, I actually feel like my own healing journey and my own work towards uh, forgiving my father made me a far more effective uh, law clerk. And yes, I did struggle, but I actually went to my judge and told her, hey, I need you to know that this is my personal history. I was sexually abused as a child. Um, I believe that I'm up for the task, but uh, I just need to voice this to you. Um, and so that was being a law clerk, that was just dealing with the subject matter more broadly. Uh, I, I knew during that time that I had to double down on my daily meditation practice um, and, and really um, up my, um, up my sort of, uh, yeah, just up my own self, um, you know, self care. It was just my own spiritual practice in order to be able to do that work. And then the very first trial that I was ever involved in was a child sexual abuse case. Um, and that was incredibly um, illuminating. I, um, I think that, again, it was really these words from His Holiness, without excusing their behavior, consider their position and their needs. Um, tap into that person's humanity. Uh, try to understand who they are um, and, and to, to see them as a human being. And so, um, I will not say that it was easy. I think that um, my own work around my own healing journey, my own spiritual work, and my own always centering, you know, uh, both Western therapy and, and my spiritual journey has really helped me be able to do these kinds of things. Um, there are some things, it's really interesting, there are things that I cannot do. Um, and the work that I think that I will never ever be able to do is environmental justice work. For some reason, um, I feel so overwhelmed by rage and sorrow that we are harming this planet, that I am ineffectual and I would need to do so much more work to deal with my emotional state around what we do to the planet um, to be able to do that work well. And so I would warmly encourage people to understand your edge and know that there are 50 quadrillion different ways to help. You know, like suffering is everywhere. First noble truth is for real. Like there's so much suffering. There's so many different permutations of suffering. There's so many different ways to be of benefit. So um, find one that it might be a stretch for you, um, but you we don't need to stretch ourselves into some hideous shape where we're actually doing ourselves and others more harm than good. There are other ways uh, to be of benefit, Miss World. So um, do you want to share the first noble truths and maybe people don't know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So the the first noble truth, um, it, it very, very briefly, the four noble truths are, the first noble truth is that um, some people say uh, all existence is suffering, or um, as we say in this lineage, um, sort of all compounded phenomenon are inherently unsatisfactory. And what that means in, in very brief, this is so not fully accurate, but um, if things have come together through causes and conditions, uh, which is everything, 
uh, those things will not be together again in the future. And our attachment to them staying that way or our need to, for them to stay that way or our need for things to change faster than they might, um, that, that, that attachment, that aversion and the ignorance from which those things flow, uh, that's, that's the cause of the suffering in the first noble truth. Uh, the second noble truth um, is that cause, right, of the first noble truth, the ignorance, uh, which is uh, breeds attachment and um, uh, aversion. Uh, the third noble truth, lucky for us, is that cessation of that suffering is possible. <laughs> and the fourth noble truth is the path uh, towards cessation. So uh, su suffering, cause, cessation, path are the four noble truths. And the first one is the truth of suffering. So I hope that was helpful. Aisha, did you have more to say about that? Or there's a question that came into me, I think for you. Oh, um, okay, go ahead. I, no, I don't, I just wanted to, you know, since we were sharing like in terms yeah. of these terms. Yeah, so there's a question here for you, which is question for Aisha. I really like what you said about getting the nutrients from the mud. I'm curious what practices support you in doing this. That was really beautiful when you were talking about, you know, when people say oh. no, there's no mud. Yeah. Uh, no, no lotus rather, you know, so yeah. practices that help you draw. Um, yeah. And I want to say like, it's not, it's not something that I've really thought a lot about up until recently is really coming encounter with, with Zen practitioners is where I've got, as I, I, I mentioned the Zen teacher, um, uh, Zenju Earthland Manuel, and also a, a friend of mine, um, um, and Zinju is a friend as well, but Yasmin Saidella talks about um, the, um, the the mud and the nutrients of the mud. And, and so for me, I've always thought about it as fire. I, for me, my, my, um, what I've always been like, I'm sitting in the fire, right? Like I'm sitting in the fire that's, but there's something for me about the mud that really just, it, it's so, it, it's resonant. It resonates with me. The, and then particularly when you think about the lotus flower, right? So it's just, and being clear that the goal isn't necessarily, it's not the flower, it's getting the nutrients of the mud. So in response to your question, I, it's, it's my practice. It's my, um, my meditative, my practice of sitting I, I came out of a tradition where I, that's all I did was sit like we weren't doing walking we weren't doing chanting we weren't all, was just sitting and being some of the things that Sujata said earlier around just observing the sensations and the in the body and, and, and really the, allowing the body to kind of be the roadmap if you will for understanding at an experiential level in permanence um, but now that, I mean, I still do that, but I also have incorporated, um, uh, walking meditation, which has been helpful for me, um, movement, um, and in a meditative container, because there are times when I just, I'm so agitated that just sitting, I just, it, it doesn't even feel possible and also chanting. Um, um, but again, like being, being in, being in it. And I, I just, I cannot underscore enough in addition to these, these practices, which I do in, in, in solitude or in community, but also the power of the Sangha, the power of community. I named friends earlier, some of whom are deep in Buddhism, others of whom are not, but just who hold the container, hold the space, you know, and kind of, you know, are helping me to, um, to not react. Even when I'm like, this is wrong. <laughs> you know, and it doesn't mean that ultimately I don't do something, but at least to just be able to hold that space. I think that we all need that. It's so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I I'm going to check. I'm just scanning the chat here really quick to see if there was something else we missed. Can we have time for like one or two more questions? Do you see anything on your side, Aisha? No. We have time for like one more question if people have one more. Aisha and Sujatha, a lot of the comments that are coming in through me are just, this is such a powerful discussion. This is amazing. So glad you invited them. So, Oh, great. That's awesome. So glad. Yeah. yeah. It's been really, um, we, I, I, like I said, I, it was fascinating because I, this morning I was whoo, in a, a rage tales tailspin and I just was like oh wow this is interesting that this is what I'm talking about today so it's like putting practice and practice and being able to to share that um you know um as well so I just received a a, a, a direct message asking how has feminism informed my Buddhist perspective 
Um, hmm. Hmm. Um, I, it actually has been, I, I, I always or often say that um, feminism, Black feminism was, I, I think, part my practice before Buddhism. And I feel like Black feminism led me to Buddhism. Um, and I'm right now co-teaching with Rima Vesley Flat, a, a course called um, Buddhism and Black Feminism at Barry Center for Buddhist Studies. Um, we're in our last two weeks. And I really, I started talking about my teacher, Tony K. Bambara, and really, been reading her and think recently and thinking about her in terms in in relationship to the four noble truths and, and causes and conditions and so I think that there there are ways in which th their writings and their perspectives can serve as gateways to the Dharma and you know nobody's living perfect lives everyone is filled with contradictions and complexities but, and there's there's something there like there are just things I've read by Audre Lorde around her writing on impermanence, that's not what she's calling it, but she's talking about impermanence. And I, I find that it, it really, for me, has um, uh, made the Dharma come alive in different ways. So it's, it's, it, is, it is not, um, it's, it's, it's really honoring both and kind of saying, oh, this is what that means. So like looking at it in, in, um, in, in my context in this lifetime as a black woman, as a feminist, um, looking at this language and then looking at the teachings, but really being clear that these are very kind of distinct uh, teachings and not kind of like saying, oh, they're all in one and the same, but there's something there that I think for me, really it's, it, to me, I'm very clear that Black feminism, along with other uh, experiences, led me to the Dharma. Um, that there, there's some very, for me, profound questions, existential questions, theoretical questions, embodied questions that folks were grappling with in their writings that resonated with me and that also sent me on a quest, which then led me to the Dharma. So I'm I'm mindful of time because I know that it's quite late oh, yeah. for East Coast folks, but I'm there are two more questions. Oh no, now there are three um, that I do want to. One is uh, neatly segues into what you were just answering. They asked um, Luke asked that could you each discuss your first encounters with Buddhism or how you've come to this path? And so I'm curious, um, Aisha, if you want to take that uh, a step further and say so. How did feminism drive you to the Dharma? <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think it's very it's so profound to me that I wrote that Korean poem in 1994, where it's like rage, meditation, action, healing. Um, and it's just really profound to me because I wasn't thinking about meditation at all. And so, but I think I was searching because I was miserable. I was suffering. I was suffering. And at even when, and I hadn't even, I knew I was a survivor, particularly of young adult rape. I knew I was a survivor of incest, but I hadn't really grappled with it at all. And I was just, and so I was looking for a way out of my misery. I feel like some kind of commercial <laughs> dharma, but it's true. It's like, this is really very true. And so, and I remember when I sat my first Vipassana meditation course in 2002, it, it just, I just, I was like, I'm home. I knew it. And, and um, it was hard and it keeps, it's getting harder, <laughs> but that's, that's what brought me was really trying to find a way um, a way through this misery. And I'm still trying to find that way and grateful for the compass that the Dharma provides. Mm, it's beautiful. Um, so I grew up in a, a lineage of Hinduism in which the Buddha is considered one of the avatars of Vishnu. And so I grew up with a whole lot of Buddhas in my house. And I was always really drawn to the Buddha. Um, and then I, at a certain point, um, became an atheist, at least didn't believe in sort of um, Hinduism per se in the way in which I was raised to believe it, but still was really drawn to the Buddha. And then I was living in India and um, met someone interestingly who uh, made me very, very angry when he was talking about this Vipassana course he had just sat and he was this, <laughs> he was someone who was expressing a lot of racism towards Indians and we were in India and he was really problematic. He was like a gem smuggler and he was going off to these Vipassana courses to learn how to stay calm while he smuggled gems across <laughs> the China border. And I mean, it was just stunning, but I couldn't get this Vipassana thing out of my head that he was talking about because he was really calm in his description of these things. And I wanted to kill him. And so, 
<laughs> so, um, so I tried really hard to get into this Vipassana course at uh, Igatpuri, um, you know, in, um, um, and I couldn't get in and then ended up going to Dharamshala instead where um, I had this chance encounter with His Holiness, but had gotten signed up for a Vipassana course uh, back in the US. Um, the, I guess it's Dhammagiri in Massachusetts. In, so 1996, I started sitting these 10 day silent meditation retreats, but I started reading His Holiness at the same time, uh, particularly uh, His Holiness's commentary on the Bodhicharya Vatara. Um, and um, it, that book changed everything for me. And uh, I was like, I'm all in. Um, and so while I continue to sit uh, the, the uh, courses in the Goenkaji tradition, I ultimately uh, ended up committing to um, this uh, Galugpa way of doing things. And I feel incredibly blessed that everywhere I've lived, there's been an FPMT Center, Foundation for the Preservation of Mahayana Tradition. So New Mexico, um, I got to study with teachers there. Um, I lived in Vermont and, you know, Venerable Rubina kept coming to Vermont. I mean, it was just, I lived in these random places and it was always these FPMT centers. So I feel incredibly grateful. Um, we have about five minutes left. I want to... Um, um, this is a really, I feel, important question, so I want to make sure that we get it in here, which is from Astrid, um, who asks, what practices do you recommend for rage that is turned against the self as a result of harm done by others, and what sense do you make of this? So Astrid, I want to talk about this briefly. Every time I see His Holiness, I ask him the same question, and he's, he's quite befuddled by this Western notion of self-hatred. He really doesn't. It just like does, It's like the one thing that he's just like, does not compute, right? Um, and it's so interesting. I mean, I'm sure it computes uh, because, you know, we think of him as a Buddha, um, but it is an interesting thing, um, this question. And so for me personally, my own journey um, has been, it started with, if I want to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings, if I believe in the collective liberation of all of us, I have to consider me as one of the all of us. You are one of the all of us. You are an equal one of all of us. So what do I make of, of this internalized, you know, rage, the internal, the, when other people have harmed me, and then I say, you know, I just think that all of the self-blame is the effectiveness of abuse. It is part and parcel of the journey of being abused, and particularly sexual harm, particularly racialized harm, harms that relate to our identities. Um, it, it, it's so um, insidious because it, it, it makes us think that we are the cause of the harm, right? For me as a Buddhist, um, it, loosening and eroding the sense, the sense of I, that self-grasping has been incredibly beneficial in getting rid of the self-hatred because there's no self to hate. Right. This is not so that was just like a weird byproduct for me of like, oh, my confidence grows because that that background noise of like I deserved it or I made people do these things to me or I am this, you know, dirty brown girl who grew up in rural Pennsylvania with all this racism or whatever, you know, all of that erodes when the notion of self erodes, the inaccurate notions of self erode. Or, I mean, they're all inaccurate notions of self from a Buddhist perspective, but, um, but these really damaging uh, negative self views erode also from the path um, of um, seeing, you know, seeing that this, this reified sense of the I uh, is really false. And that there is, that, that when we loosen that, um, there's just a lot of, um, there's a lot of um, freedom in that from all kinds of neuroses, <laughs> um, including the one in which we have um, drank the poison of, um, of self-hatred when, when it was handed to us by people who should not have done so. So Jatha, did you want to say briefly, um, there was a, a one question that um, we received asking, what are we working on next? Oh. Um, so I will just share that I'm completing a trilogy of work. So it started with No, my film, The Rape Documentary, and then my anthology, uh, Love with Accountability, Digging Up the Roots of Child Sexual Abuse, and now um, an untitled uh, book project. Um, and so for, I've looked at, for I've, I've spent many years um, documenting and collecting the stories of 
diasporic Black survivors of sexual violence, adult and childhood. Um, and that was very important work. Um, but, and now I feel like I'm in a, I know I'm in the place to look inward and, 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 ex and explore my, um, my journey. So it's always, I would offer that I'm through, I mean, I definitely wrote an introduction to Love with Accountability and I'm, you know, produced the film, no, but this time I'm really going in and going deep. And so it's very, um, it's very intense, grateful for practice, grateful for an incredible uh, therapist who's also a Dharma teacher. So it just feels like a real gift. This is a new relationship. And so I'm really grateful for that and, and for community, but that's what I'm, I'm working on and on. pushing forward. Um, I am uh, almost done. I've got two chapters left of a 10 chapter book, um, two chapters to edit. That's pretty much finished a, a book about meeting his holiness when I was uh, 24 years old and um, my journey to forgiveness. And so it's a book about forgiveness. It's called Angry Long Enough. Um, in response to his question, do you feel you've been angry long enough? Um, about that one thing, yes. <laughs> there are other things that I am not. I have not been angry long enough. And so that's, uh, that is in the finishing uh, works. And then the next uh, two pieces, I'm trying to, I'm thinking of a three book sort of thing. Uh, one is about paradigm shift um, in social justice movements and um, looking a little bit about, you know, the Dharma is a, just such a spectacular paradigm shift model and looking at uh, Thomas Kuhn's structures of scientific revolution and the um, way in which paradigm shift is uh, beautifully explained in that book and how can we benefit from that in our own social justice movement work uh, what kind of paradigm shifts are we called to uh, in our work and and sort of relating that to indigenous peacemaking and restorative justice and then somewhere in here i've got to grapple with the fact that there's a whole lot of uh, cultural appropriation that occurs within the restorative justice movement of uh, indigenous people's practices and sort of what my own culpability has been in that and then my own experiences about my own cultural practices being appropriated. Um, and so what does it look like to sit in the middle of that very thorny, yucky Venn diagram? Um, and um, and speaking, so, uh, speaking to what Aisha so beautifully spoke about, how we all cause harm and we all experience harm. And so um, wanting to hold that mirror up to myself. But we have gone over time. We do not want to keep people too late, especially East Coast folks. And so um, I want to just, uh, I said that I would do a little very brief um, centering dedication uh, of uh, the merits of what we have done together tonight. We super appreciate everyone's questions. We're sorry if we didn't get to all of them. Um, and um, before I turn it over to Gina to officially close out the event, um, let's just take a moment to uh, notice that we have bodies and we have breath. We have this present moment together still. And as we close, let's take a moment to think about the merit, all the positivity we've increased through talking and listening and deeply considering these complex things. And let's dedicate those merits that we've individually and collectively gathered tonight to the benefit of all sentient beings. Let's close out with these wishes. May we all ultimately be free from the suffering that comes with anger and from all the internal and external causes of anger. May all beings be happy. May all beings be free from oppression and from all forms of suffering. May all beings have what they need for their good health and their well being. May all beings be peaceful and at ease. Thank you, everyone. Gina, I'm going to hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Sujatha, and um, thank you, Aisha. Um, I was excited about this event really from the first time we started talking about it. And um, it was even more than I expected. So I'm feeling really energized. So I wanna thank both of you um, for your time, your stories, your perspectives. I know I speak for all our staff and our students when I say, I hope you can come back again. 
Um, I'm already picturing a whole series on spiritual bypassing, <laughs> but I hope we can, can all continue the conversation on how our practice can support our participation in the challenges and the apparent realities you talked about. I personally am believing, and I think we can end really well on the refrain, rage, meditation, healing, and action. So thank you all so much for being here. Um, we really appreciate your participation and um, joining us tonight. Thank you. Hi, thank you.